In the early 70s, my father worked in a small radio station in Santiago, one of the islands of Cape Verde, a small Atlantic archipelago off the west coast of Africa. The stories he shares about that time are of a world where information went much slower and where, as a medium, radio was very close to the listeners, mainly through snail mail. And one of the segments I've always found interesting and touching had to do with the fact that Cape Verde is composed of small islands where there's a lot of emigration, historically. He would receive letters from people wanting to reach their loved ones who were on a ship crossing the ocean, most often to North America, or on a commercial or fishing boat. And the radio waves would bring a favorite or meaningful piece of music across the distance to those who were far away. My thinking is that so many of us move away from home, from friends, often across continents to do our PhD and become young researchers. And I wanted to offer that type of slow audio messaging to the listeners of Papa PhD. To someone you left behind, to someone you're temporarily separated from, to parents and friends, from parents and friends, or even to your old lab mates. It can even be a message you'll be sending through time five years ago or ten years ago to yourself. And my role is simply to read it in your name or anonymously on Papa PhD. So if you have a message, a poem, a short composition, always in the context of the PhD, send it to me to david at papaphd.com and it'll be my pleasure to read it in a future episode. The goal of this segment, which I will call the PhD Grams, is simply to give voice to those words that are sometimes hard to say, to those conversations that are sometimes hard to have, and to build relationships and community amongst the listeners who tune in week after week. If you follow Papa PhD on Facebook, you can actually leave me an audio message on Messenger and let me know if you allow me to use it as is on the podcast. And I'm over the moon happy to say that today... I'm going to be reading the first ever PhD gram right at the beginning of the interview. And now for my conversation with Danielle White. I remember feeling perhaps more empowered as a factory worker than I did as a PhD candidate um, because of the, the, the way that that can feel when you're in the institutions can feel quite, you know, I mean, I had some wonderful, wonderful uh, networks and, and collaboration connections and colleagues that I was speaking to and we had a really a really, really nice community, and that community was, was fantastic. But I think as, you know, as within universities in that space, I think there's a lot of, of PhDs that can feel very isolated and alone with what it is that they're moving through. And that whole piece around how valuable will I be to an employer and that emphasis upon the PhD, the PhD is, is, is great. It's a fantastic training process that can teach you a hell of a lot of transferable skills that are incredibly valuable. But how you communicate that value is something that requires a little thought. And who to, who are you communicating that value to? Because that's got to be, that's got to feel right for you, you know? Not, well, I've got a PhD, so I should look at academia or I'd be wasting the PhD if I didn't, if I didn't go into academia, I've done all this work and then I'm not even going to be working in that space or being a lecturer. It's like, well, you know, the PhD is an asset. Like, use it in the way you want to use it. Welcome to Papa PhD with David Mendez, the podcast where we explore careers and life after grad school with guests who have walked the road less traveled and have unique stories to tell about how they made their place in a world of constantly evolving rules. Get ready to go off the beaten path and hop on for an exciting new episode of Papa PhD. Welcome to this new episode of Papa PhD, this week with Dr. Danielle White, calling from Manchester, so on the other side of the pond. Danielle is the founder and director of Periscope Programs. She has been co-signing career transition programs for over 20 years. 
Working across the education system as a career advisor, former academic and executive coach, clients have included heads of school at primary, secondary, and university level, research staff, lecturers, and PhDs at different stages. Daniel is a self-taught entrepreneur who holds a keen interest in supporting people to better manage their career. Welcome to Papa PhD, Danielle. Um, yeah, it is. And so we're going to be talking about the, all these years of experience you've had. We're going to also be talking about Periscope programs, this this uh, uh, company that that you that you run with a with a team of people, um, but. Just to start, uh, I'm going to, and this is a new feature for the show, I'm going to read the, the, the show's first PhD gram. So I've asked listeners to send me a, a message to read, to read on the show, naming them or anonymously, which could be for, uh, you know, uh, to someone they, they, that's on another continent, you know, because People who, who do PhDs often leave their country to go to go uh, fo to go follow that uh, that that endeavor. Um, it could be uh, to uh, actually to someone you're in, in on a long distance relationship with, which also is frequent. But also, I suggested it could be to you five years ago or you ten years ago, depending on depending on where you are after your PhD and. A listener, uh, Mega Tiagi, sent me a message, and I'm going to read it here on the air, and maybe then we can we can start from from there. So Mega said the following: She said, "I would like to send a message to me for from five years ago, and the message is: Please be patient, don't take tension, break all the big, seemingly unachievable tasks into smaller ones, and try to structure your day." Travel as much as possible, otherwise, what is the point of living near the foothills of the great Himalayas? Also, please make more friends outside your university. Mega, this, I'm super, super happy you sent this message, this first PhD gram. Um, and, uh, and thank you, thank you so much. And, uh, I hope this will inspire, this will inspire other people to also, to also, uh, contribute to this, uh, to this kind of, audio billboard thing that I that I'm trying to to set up with the PhD grams. <laughs> what do you think about the, this message Danielle? I think that's lovely. I think it's really great. I love what it's capturing. Um I think that whole thing around, you know, when you're in a certain space feeling um perhaps a little intimidated or overwhelmed and breaking it down um into something that feels uh yeah, that feels manageable and um recognizing the importance of people and experiences i'm a big advocate of travel i spend a lot of a uh, lot of my my time uh in one country or another uh working remotely so yeah that's uh that's 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 yeah i think it's really really nice i think it's really important it's a lovely way to think and it's a way that we often don't think i think certainly when we're at certain moments that that feel um quite challenging let's say yes there's so much happening we were we had there's this kind of a sensory overwhelm that there's a lot of stuff that we don't even see and and can't even process and uh no i agree i agree and it's interesting to have someone just tell you okay take breathe take your time this is gonna work <laughs> take small bites etc etc so again thanks mega for having sent us the first phd gram <laughs> Uh, Danielle, now about um, the the short introduction I I, uh, I did for you. Is there something you would add? What would be one thing you would add to who is uh, Dr. Danielle White and uh, and how how did she get to where she is today? Um, well, I guess um, I feel that a big part of of who I am is around the travel and the uh, the the way that I incorporate that into what. I do professionally and that and that balance you know that 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 feels that feels really important and I guess I feel that um yeah in that journey there's been a huge amount of um uh things that I've worked through gently um and I think that post is really lovely for that it's you know when you're in the moment of feeling that you're at this point of shifting this point of stepping up to the next moment then uh then i guess i have quite a growth mindset around that i see that as an opportunity 
to talk to people and learn about what I don't yet know and um and be humble about that I guess to to kind of yeah to to to, to gently find my way through it mm -hmm. that's interesting as uh, thinking about travel as as a, a path of humility I think it makes a it makes a lot of sense to me <laughs> and it, it is actually super interesting that actually you know you didn't know that i had this message to read and somehow <laughs> there's this connection between between what uh, what megha and and you uh, advocate for now a question so you know often once someone someone starts a phd the tendency will be to say uh, and this is one of the things that i that i'd love to, to help to help people with to change this mindset of All of the rest of my life is put on hold. Now I'm doing this thing. During your PhD, were you able to to follow this this uh, this kind of um, uh, taste of yours or or this philosophy of yours of incorporating travel and meeting people during the the PhD journey? Uh, no, it wasn't something that happened during the PhD journey. Within the journey, I was very immersed. Um, I was I was uh, yeah I was. Um, my phd was uh was funded so um so yeah so i was i was actively involved in different projects um and different funding and that was uh something that i yeah i really got involved in to get the most experience that i could really from from that space and trying to understand you know what the next bit looked like Uh, but yeah, the travel wasn't part of my. It was before, and it was, and it has been afterwards. After, <laughs> yeah, I was very rooted in that time, mostly mm -hmm. to coffee shops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as a lot of us end up being at that time. That being said, I've I've spoken with people who have, you know, actually what not to travel per se, but uh, to because they had a possibility of work in industry who put their funding and their PhD on hold after doing a, a good chunk of it that and with you know that that worked well talked with their supervisor said okay six months I'm going I have this invitation to to do this mm -hmm. I really want to try it can we put the project and the funding on hold and they were able to to do it go test and come back so you know it's depending on on where you are and what um, how your funding works etc you can actually uh you can take breaks uh and and uh you know not not a lot of them of course because there needs to be some consistency to to what to what you do depending also on on the domain you work in but um i think you know i see i i, I mean, anyway i've seen some people who were able i wasn't but who were able to even during their phd find like make some parentheses take some breathers and then come back so Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the opportunity for the conferences and things like this, I mean, those are happening more, you know, have been happening more kind of online, but in different spaces. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, going to different things and, and I guess just thinking about, you know, even within that space, it's a very reflective space. It's an opportunity to be reflective about what's happening next. So if travel is something that's a real identifier, actually, that is something that I want to incorporate in, then how do you um, therefore work remotely? Um, you know, in the next opportunity, what does that look like? And how does that as a lifestyle choice influence the way in which you're selecting and gravitating towards certain kinds of areas? Um, and that's, yeah, that's definitely something that I do um, quite a lot of exploring during uh, the programs that we run. So that that's something that, that comes up around, you know, what, what are the, what are the requirements of the individual around what they want to be doing professionally? Mm -hmm. That that's uh, that's that's super interesting. Now, uh, so like on that side of the pond, and 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 you know, in the UK particularly, my my understanding is that PhDs, you know, people have three years to do their PhD, uh, maybe with some some buffer, but really not a lot. And here, uh, here in Canada, for example, it can go much, much longer. But anyway, I think if eventually this might we might talk about this during the conversation because it it, it might differ. Things might differ a little bit uh, if you're thinking of doing something in three years uh, versus maybe having a good chunk, you know, uh, something more closer to five, six. It's mm -hmm. a different chunk of your life that you're dedicating to the project. But um, my first 
question to you and given all this experience you have is even though there's there are these differences there are you know the the phd experience the phd journey there's some commonalities that 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 are there even though uh you might do a longer phd there's thing, things that are common and i'm i'm where i'm going is what would you say are like the most um most common the most frequent uh gaps or or um pain points to call them like that that people the phds you've worked with come to you with that are that are like a common thread amongst all of them in terms of career transition and career readiness um a lot of people don't recognize the value that they hold or how to um communicate that where they sit now they recognize that they're a different person now to who they were when they started the doctorate um but not necessarily clear who that is what their professional identity is and so that place emotionally is one that can create a lot of procrastination and i think that it's not perhaps understood the the um the extent to which that can affect things and i think people can judge themselves for that procrastination and why am i not being efficient when actually there's a process going on there underneath uh which is huge absolutely huge and um and 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 fundamentally at the, the core of it is is you know there's a few things at the core but but one of them is is um is is what is what is my professional value now and a question that that is often not sort of directly asked is what what am i looking for now what am i where do i want to move how do i want to shift what's important to me because of the external um expectations being so strong and having reached the top of your academic game in terms of qualification not necessarily experience but in terms of qualification but yet still feeling quite low in the pecking order in a way it's I mean I remember feeling perhaps more empowered as a factory worker than I did as a PhD candidate um <laughs> because of the 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 way that that can feel when you're in the institutions can feel quite you know I mean I had some wonderful wonderful uh, networks and, and collaboration connections and colleagues that I was speaking to and we had a really a really really nice community and that community was was fantastic but I think as as you know, as within universities in that space, I think there's a lot of, of PhDs that can feel very isolated um, and alone with what it is that they're moving through. And and that whole piece around, you know, how valuable will I be to an employer and that emphasis upon the PhD, the, the PhD is, um, you know, I could, the PhD is, is, is great. It's, um, it's, it's a fantastic training process that can teach you a hell of a lot of transferable skills that are incredibly valuable. But how you communicate that value uh, is, is, is something that requires a little thought. And who to, who are you communicating that value to? Because that's got to be, that's got to feel right for you, you know. Not, well, I've got a PhD, so I should look at academia, or I'd be wasting the PhD if I didn't if I didn't go into academia I've done all this work and then I'm not even going to be working in that space or being a lecturer it's like well you know the PhD is an asset like use it in the way you want to use it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you touched on, on a very important point uh, which is this kind of an identity crisis that that you get into once you finish your PhD and especially if you realize uh, or you've already realized by the end of it that you not going to follow up in academia there's you know you can get paralyzed and you talked about procrastination and and also some paralysis of okay who am i now like how do i present myself to someone who's in business or someone who's in industry are are they gonna even uh give any value to to uh, to my training and uh it can be yeah it can be paralyzing i i agree uh and not i think there's some movement also in uh, in terms of um, trying to get 
industry and and people with academic backgrounds to to speak and to get to know each other yeah. but it's like you know it's like some of the you know you it's like you talk two different languages and if you don't if you don't have any training or you you haven't done any internship in in the private sector you don't have the language you don't have the terminology and those first meetings can be frustrating uh, you can feel like, like you said, okay, I, I just lost my time getting this degree because now I people are not employing me because they're they're they don't value this this thing that I did, and um, yeah, it's a very very important point, and it can can have effects on mental health, uh, I I think. And now my my question to you is, what are what are uh, uh, tools? What are strategies? to preclude this kind of disconnect and this this kind of uh, uh, inability to communicate uh, with people in these other spheres how can you kind of sh close the gap to have the to have easier and more effective first conversations once you start going on linkedin let's say and speaking with someone who's actually in the pharma industry now that you finish let's say your phd in in the, in the biology domain yeah, nice. It's actually a conversation that I was having just before this one was with somebody called <laughs> Rachel Zerg, yeah, who I, who I work with. She's one of the other facilitators, and and she's. Um, we were talking about the community space that we're building because we're building a, a community space. We're we're looking for working group members at the moment, actually. And one of the things we were talking about directly was the, um, was the bridge between industry. And the bridge between and there's and there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different organisations and people that we're already talking to who recognise the value of people with PhDs in terms of their analysis skills, their ability to digest complex data and communicate with clarity, with credibility, and all of this. There's 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 a lot of um, recognition there, so we're looking at that that. Um, uh, bringing the two together, really, the people who are wanting to employ with the people who are um, who are who are wanting to understand how to better communicate. But the um, but when you ask that about you know what can people do, you know that the question really, I guess, is about networking and networking at the moment as the way things are and the way that things are uh, are shifting and moving. I mean, I think that there's a much more deliberate approach to networking now that's needed than before. Um, it's, it's, it's much more, you know, what am I interested in here? What am I, where am I interested? What, what sort of roles am I interested in? What do we understand about those roles? Where do the individuals who exist in those roles hang out? And how can I approach them? And in what way will I approach them? And what is um, what's a good intro? You know, how can I imagine them on the other side responding to my question of a of a of a conversation on Zoom, um, you know, or, or a chat? What what could that conversation look like? You know, you you know, what would I like to understand as a result of that conversation? And you know what? What can I offer? Is there anything I can offer them, or, or, or you know, how will I introduce myself? And, and I think, I think you know, nine times out of ten, people are really happy to share where they've come from and what they think about where they are and and where they're working. They're really, really happy to share that because we've all gone through it in order to get to where we are, and we've not done it alone. And it's lovely to be recognised um, as well for where we're. And I think these sorts of conversations can be lovely, can be really valuable for people. Also, oh, how did you get there? And 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 what was that like? And how did they see that qualification? And what did you talk? And especially, you know, especially with uh, PhD alumni, you know, because there's a real there's a real chance there to support each other. And a lot of people are very willing to do that because they remember what it was like before. Um, so so yeah, I think you know, really encourage people to approach certainly within the phd you know approach within the phd and think about um you know and think about okay what yeah what 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 might that help me to think about in terms of what skills would be useful for me to develop because you'll have stuff that will come out of that conversation you'll think 
or I could do with a bit more a bit more time in presenting what I'm doing and actually that would really serve me in this it'd be great in an interview because I'd be able to talk about that event um and they'd find that valuable you know mhm uh, yeah the I, I i agree with that always the thing that uh that i i find uh challenging is time is is a very uh is a very uh valuable uh asset during the phd uh, and and some some people in the structure and then your your phd thesis supervisor kind of really want you to spend as much as much as much time as possible on the project with them and you know to to think about these things to engage in these conversations takes time and i wonder whether uh in your experience because you've worked with universities you know do you feel that you know uh, phd programs or departments are opening up to the or, or yeah opening up is a, is a good way maybe to say it to the fact that students need to invest some time in also preparing their future life you know outside the the lab outside grad school because i think this is where people there's been a report uh here in canada and now i don't remember the name of it that states that there's a, maybe six years of a gap uh, let's say in terms of salary and 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 uh and uh starting to uh to contribute to your retirement fund etc cetera, etc cetera, when someone gets out of, of a phd versus someone who got out at the masters and again phds are longer here but i think uh i feel that i see programs uh having to do with career readiness and and transferable skills etc i see them uh popping up on twitter etc is it something is is there a movement in your experience are there or or is it just punctual universities that are that are kind of uh waking up to this and 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 um, kind of investing some money yeah. and 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 resources to to help graduate students also you know not be so late to the game when they finish their phd yeah yeah definitely i've i've noticed a shift in the way that people are talking about this and also uh what's being invested um so yeah i mean i i uh, i started as a um as uh, an external uh, consultant running um one program uh, which was called what can i do with a doctorate Okay. Uh, super cool <laughs> super, <laughs> straight to the point yeah yeah and um and 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 then since um i've worked with some of the people and we've developed some shorter workshops two hour workshops half you know half an hour keynote um and and a few other programs and these um these have come as a result of universities asking if we could run um uh, a workshop on you know networking with industry communicating with employers you know um a conversation that I had with the university of kent uh, yesterday was 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 wonderful because they talked to me about a two day event around phd career management that they're running uh with their late stage phds and the event is all about moving through um you know the the, the challenges recognizing the, the value of the phd working through a, an audit of your skills looking at um you know the options that are available and then creating a, a strategy to move forward and and the different elements of that and the different parts of that for different people who are speaking and a lot of the speakers are external like myself um like Rachel you know so they've come to us to say oh would you be able to provide one to one coaching would you be able to provide a workshop on this on that so that dialogue and that conversation comes out of the challenges that they notice that they want to support their PhDs within that space. Not all universities um, are offering external, some are doing internal support within that. And it varies from place to place as to what's being offered. Um, you know, but there's definitely 
a much I'm noticing a much more informed conversation around PhDs of you know valuable valuable credentials how do we support our graduates to utilize them and communicate them um, to the next place that they want to engage whether that's self-employment portfolio career academia or other areas of work that exist outside of that yeah actually you just said it said this uh, academia and it's important like this conversation you know a lot of uh you know, all of the guests I bring on the show on Papa PhD are outside academia, not all of them. But even within academia, you need to be able to present yourself, you need to be a good candidate, etc. Et so these discussions and, and developing these skills, uh, it, it's something that will be uh, that will be important in the academic con- context also. Oh, really? I, I Honestly, well, very, I mean, actually, there was, a, there was an international workshop. There was a, a workshop, I think it was in Italy, um, that ran a couple of years ago. And that was specifically focused on um, impact within uh, impact and entrepreneurship within the academic space. So it was looking at how, you know, as academics within a university context, you engage with the outside world in order to be able to support, um, you, in order to be able to utilise that knowledge for um, you know, change in the charity sector or for research impact or for, you know, all of these different different areas. So, yeah, it's a real, it's, it's an important, it's an important thing that the universities are measured on as well. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm super happy to talk to about hear. interviews, if you, you know, if you're interested, you know, to go down that road, really important for interview um, uh, questions as well will be around impact. Mm-hmm. That's That's, I'm super, super happy to hear that because I think, I think it's a conversation that cannot, you know, that now we can't wait to have to we wait anymore to have it and to have it at a larger and larger scale. But it's good to hear that that uh, for you who are working in the domain, you see that things are happening. So that that's great. Now about your particular projects, you talked about creating a community. Uh, I've mentioned uh, Periscope programs. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing today in that context? Yeah, no worries. So, uh, so one of the things that we're working on at the moment um, is um, we're building a community for PhDs and academics um, who are wanting to either progress within academia or outside of it, and that's uh, being headed by a working group of volunteers. Uh, who are willing to uh, give their time to support other people in that space, uh, develop resources and run, for example, Shut Up and Rights, um, you know, uh, other other events and workshops. And that is going to be a space where what we would like to see in the long run is is bridging that gap between employers and the people that, that we've got in that space. So first of all, it will be a space where people can like, really meet each other and 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 share um what's happening for them engage in content that's uh that's going to be useful to uh thinking about um their career and, and what's happening with that but, but also doing the engaging so yeah that's that's one thing um that's one thing that's happening um and yeah um the other the other is uh is that i'm running um um yeah just developing uh, some some new workshops but we're also continuing to run uh the ones that we've been running for for a good few years now in the intro uh, you've mentioned you've you know you've worked with people at different levels uh, periscope programs is it sp- especially uh, geared towards phds or it's it's just part of a uh, part of the, the 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 public you're you're serving uh so the Periscope programs is running um, programs which are more focused towards PhDs. Um, we want to widen that out to uh, to other groups of graduates, but so far it's been um, MRes and PhDs, so PGRs. Uh, we say I don't know if it's the same terminology actually. Is uh, it not? It's not the terminology I know. No, is it not? Okay, so we say postgraduate researchers, and that includes MA level. Um, okay, yeah. And PhD, so anybody that's doing some form of research, whether it's you know, yeah, whatever level that is, um, and the yeah, we we're wanting to develop and run for 
uh, degree level, uh, but it's not something that we're offering at the moment. We also work with career switchers um, who are moving from one industry to another. I do that as a collaborative piece with another organization. We run those about twice a year, and that's a 12-week program. Is it group programs? Is it one-on-ones? What can people expect when when enrolling in a program with you guys? Yeah, so uh, so the groups uh, tend to be uh, 12 people, uh, 12, uh, 12 to 18, I would say. We don't like to go over that. And then um, and those those programs are a mixture of um, pre work, which is like a video link to an activity, and then people come in, and then there's a bit of talk, and then there's some group work where people are working together in groups, and some of that can be peer, so it's people working through what they've gone through individually with another person. Um, with a structure so they can really think that through and get into it so they're applying it and then they're getting into it for themselves and then we'll feed back and we'll bring everything together Um, so that's the structure of how they work and we tend to do sort of this it's mostly six sessions the 12 session one has also got um, uh, stuff around mindset um, which uh, yeah which is mindset and confidence and 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 really getting into the headspace Uh, before before moving into it so that's what that 12 week one is and it's another organization that runs that um so yeah people people can jo- what we're doing is we're collecting interest for people who would be wanting to uh to to have a place on a program uh, so it might be like a two hour workshop or it might be a longer program so um i was working before um Uh, this the periscope programs is is um is a is something which has 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 been like a rebrand that that happened quite recently and and what we're doing is we're it's something i've been running for about four years and with other people for for a year or two but um but this is this is an opportunity for people to uh, engage more directly rather than only working with the universities you were going to to talk about dates i guess but maybe can you just share two or three uh because i imagine these programs have uh, name you know titles that kind of indicate what what they're geared towards do you have two or three t- titles of these programs you can share and then maybe dates of upcoming upcoming programs yeah yeah so um so we've got uh the utilizing a doctorate Uh, which is for people who are at the very beginning of their PhD journey. So that's that's basically about what to expect and what you're going to get out of it and how to think about what you've done before um, and what skills you'll get out of the PhD and how to utilize your training, how to utilize your PhD training. So it's it's just having a few like little pointers um, around um, how to think about Uh, the management of your career while you're doing your PhD. And uh, when when is that coming up? Uh, so we've got um, we've got a few that are with um, we've got a few that are with unis um, coming up, but we are collecting uh, interest for uh, for people. If if we if we get a group of um, so if we get a group of twelve, then we could we could run in June or July. So, so yeah, if people are interested in the message. Okay. So admin at periscopeprograms.com. I imagine if people have interest, they can write to that email and, yeah, uh, and you'll get exactly. back to them. Now the question is, so is this, uh, should people try talk with the university to get you guys to go there or can, that's or can just of doing it yeah that's what i was going to say so there's there's two yeah there's there's a few different ways of doing it um we're yeah we're currently working with manchester mmu um ken and um de Montfort and uh the doctoral training alliance and south coast doctoral training partnership so any of those spaces um have got availability you know have got programs that are run so you can tap into that and and that's something that's available that you would not need to pay for um we're also um we're also offering spaces which would come from your um your your budget as a PhD. So so often people have got budgets that can be applied for in order to go on these um, these sorts of things. 
so we're going to be running some place by place workshops and that's something that we're that we're doing if that's something that you're interested in understanding how it works or how we can support you with that then again just get in touch um but we're also the, the way it's working at the moment is l- the programs that we're running are paid for by universities or doctoral training programs and they pay for the entire program and the entire workshop and they're exclusive to those universities so if you're part of any of those universities you will be able to access a place no problem but it's a new thing that we're we, we're sort of offering out to individuals on a place by place so it's definitely something that um yeah we've had a lot of interest in doing that but we're just at the point of pooling it so so yeah so it might just be that you might have to wait for about three months I would say until we've we've got the rest of those places but but yeah that's um that's definitely something that um that that we're going to be offering moving forward perfect well and and also I'd, I'd say if you are uh, in a university that's not covered now well get get together with colleagues talk with your program and get in touch with periscope with periscope programs and see if you can bring it to your university i think that's uh yeah you know, getting be- organized getting organized is always good yeah definitely that would be great and we can we can support you with that as well we know sort of who the people are who who you know who have the budget for that and who would be interested in bringing in um an external and yeah we, we'd be really happy to to support to support with that process and the other thing is if there's people who are organizing any events that are more community events um then that's something that we that we also just we will come in and do that and there's there's not a charge for that we will just we want to support the community around what's happening so we've often been asked to speak at um PhD conferences that are like local conferences organized by committees. Um, so yeah, we'd be be really, really happy to do that. So again, just get in touch. Perfect. That's, that's awesome. And that would be again, can you state that uh, email address again for the listeners? So it's uh, it's admin at periscopeprograms.com. And programs the 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 the, the, the British uh, spelling M M E S at the end. Yeah, double N E S exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very cool. Uh Danielle, now we're getting to the to the uh to the end of the interview and um I I I'd like to uh, to ask you maybe because I think all of us this conversation would already be awesome uh if we were you know if COVID wasn't around. Uh but I think you know you talked about community, you talked about uh you know, widening your network a little bit. You know, doing 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 some things that will help you uh, have more productive conversations once you start thinking of transitioning. Now, people are not meeting people for coffee these days or for beer, or at least are much in different places. Parts of the world can be very limited in how much they can do it. So that way of networking is not you know it's not easy right now with covid as it is maybe things are changing because it's been uh, over 2 years and uh, and um, maybe maybe uh, the, the vaccine coverage will help us switch gears into something more open in terms of uh, uh, of being able to meet people freely but for people who might be at home uh thinking okay I'm writing, this is hard, you know, what what can I do from home? You know, I, I'm kind of not finding my words, but what would be advice f- from you based on your experience uh, as to what can people easily in the next five minutes on their computer do to start working towards this wider network, this this wider, you know, language and, and culture? Um, but from from their computer, which is where people are living most of their time these days. Yeah, I think um, I think that it just brings me yeah back to the just being a bit more deliberate about reaching out. I think I think I think it's probably that. Um, I think it's accessing what you can while you've got the the opportunity to uh be quite grounded you know where you are and have have a little bit more of that space and and just thinking okay so um 
you know what I'm looking for and 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 using those research skills um that you're developing to really think about okay so what are the questions that I want answering what questions are important to me and and how how can I go about finding that information um yeah, like it's a research, it's a it's a research piece in a way, but yeah, and I think we're just reaching out. I think it can feel quite isolating sometimes when we're in our silos. I know a lot of people have gone home to different places as well. They were studying in different universities, um, and then have gone back, or have you know, or have ended up somewhere else. I think perhaps away from the people that they were engaging with um, intellectually. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's does make it does make it that bit more challenging um but i would probably go back to some of the conversations i was having before around like the the networking and how to how, where how to think about that that and those networks um so going on linkedin and reaching out to people and reach, to yeah reaching alumni out to things like that yeah reaching out reaching out to people who are perhaps posting on twitter or in linkedin or you know people who are who are um in a particular you know perhaps perhaps in a particular role um, that you might want to be finding out a bit more about, um, and yeah, just just connecting with people gently. It doesn't have to be like a big. It can just be, oh, I'll I'll just see how that goes, or I'll just see how that goes, um, you know. And yeah, um, just 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 gently. It, it can be very organic. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I imagine the the community that that you are trying to to build uh, with with uh, around uh, Periscope programs is going to help because. Uh, it's going to already be people, you know, the, the the community will be selected to be people who are in that precise uh, uh, moment of their life of re of rethinking their career or just thinking what where they're going next. So if if you have around you, uh, and one of the first thing is, are there student communities around you where you are that have I don't know Zooms and or things like that, writing groups do that. If not, a community that is created specifically for that is awesome and then if not like you said linkedin twitter uh, there, there's a lot happening there there's a lot people are sharing there people are especially i see people helping you know phds that are coming out with so much uh, um, um almost passion for it that i see you know people who've gone before done it earlier on in their lives and who are just ready to give any help they can to people who are just coming out and asking questions. So don't, don't hesitate to hop on those platforms and ask questions, listen into conversations and, and then just allow yourself to, to, uh, yeah, to take, to sometimes comment and eventually you'll see, uh, things will, things will start happening. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's, I think, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, the people that we've been speaking to are interested in joining the working group. There's a lot of, um, of, of desire to, 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 to connect, you know, with others who are in the same space. I mean, you know, Rabia, for example, who've been working with for a little while, she's, you know, she's been doing some brilliant work. Um, you know she she's very aware of of what those challenges are and actively is looking to connect and communicate and support you know different people who are who are um who are going through that and thinking through you know well actually um you know what what is it that i'm wanting to do here and what does that look like um and put on for example you know writing groups for people who are who are procrastinating around, you know, what's happening and what they're doing and just just having a writing group for people who are interested in publishing or interested in writing chapter three yeah. or you yes. know, whatever, that, <laughs> whatever that whatever that looks like. Um so I think, yeah, I think there's there's a really strong desire um for people to connect. So it's just a case of, you know, these spaces are really, you know, be really, really welcoming of anybody who's interested in in being a part of that i think it'd be lovely to make that a bit more wider than than uk we've you know we've we've we've, we've just got people in the uk at the moment so it'd be lovely to to make that a bit wider sure um, and and like i said at the beginning the the the, the obstacles and the difficulties that uh, that people find in the uk well the people who are here in canada or the us or japan they, there's it, they're the same the, the struggle is the same in many aspects so i think yeah it'd be great it'd be great to 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 have this platform where you could you could meet people from different 
areas of different uh, parts of the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, no, Danielle, p if people want to reach out to you, what is the best platform? Where, where, where are you most uh, available um, to respond? LinkedIn is good, definitely. Um, so connect there. I'm quite active. I post quite a lot on there. We've got um, a Periscope programs uh, LinkedIn page as well, which is just uh, that was only set up quite recently. Um, so that's so that's there's different posts and information um, opportunities on there. Uh, so yeah, um, that's that's a good space. Um, email if you're interested in having a conversation or, or you know do, do that. Use the use the email that's um, below. Um, I'd probably want to, yeah, on the on the website, um, what you were asking about, what what is it that we've got? There's all of the programs that we run are on the website. Uh, so, yeah, the two hours and the the longer transformative programs, they're on there. There's um there's a there's a di brief description on each of them and who they're for. And then there's an opportunity to to learn more. Um, so there's kind of a drop down menu that gives extra details, um, and there's a chat box on there as well. So so yeah, just um, do do feel free do feel free to to reach out. I know when you were asking that question, I was slightly distracted by the puppy, but <laughs> you know funny. we've got some uh, we've got some yeah we've got we've the programs that we've got have been co designed by people who've been through the longer program over the period of time. So they've been so one of them is. Um, networking with industry which uh, covers some of the points that we were looking at there but it gives clear resources a clear strategy about how to do that how to approach people um you know the utilizing one that i mentioned is very much for early stage phds and then we've got the uh, roadmap uh, route to clarity which is um uh, basically a um, it can be run either as a, as a as an overview of the process that people go through to transition. So it's a really nice, clear process that's got very um, uh, very simple stages, but it's informed by social mobility theory. So it's it's got depth, but it's I mean my PhD was in career transition, so it's it's got depth, but it's also very practical. So that's um, sometimes we run that as a 30 minute presentation with a QA. and a uh, And sometimes it's a two hour workshop that's engaging and you get to play with the first part of the model with all the people in, in the room. So it's really nice. All of the workshops are super interactive. Um, the, we use, yeah, we use Padlet and, and Jamboard and Moro and, you know, different things like that that we use. <laughs> to make to, it more interactive. To make it a bit more, yeah, a bit more engaging, sort of mm -hmm. interactive. So, yeah, we've got those. Um, and there's, there's some others, there's some others as well. So, um, yeah, um, there's some for academics and, but have a look, have a look if you're interested. Okay. And so they're all on, uh, Periscope programs with uh, M M E S at the end dot com, and I'll put that link and all the other ones, even including your LinkedIn, in the show notes, and so Amazing. people will be able to to follow them and uh, and go and go say hi and thank you. <laughs> all right, uh, Danielle, this has been a great conversation. I think the the project is is uh, really interesting. Um, and I, I I hope that the community is going to be gl a global one. And a vibrant one, and uh, and yeah, I wish all the best to your projects. Thanks for having come on, Papa PhD. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Papa PhD podcast. Head over to papaphd.com for show notes and for more food for thought about non-academic postgrad careers. I'll always be happy to share inspiring stories, new ideas, and useful resources here on the podcast. So make sure you subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts to always keep up with the discussion and to hear from our latest guests. Music